let me show you my experience and uh, uh, I couldn't help but go to the upper room also uh, with the view of uh, all that excitement and all that uh, stuff that was happening on I'm sorry I'm not quite as spiritual as you guys to go into that uh, inner room of burning uh, so I, I got on your coattails as much as I could but I don't know, maybe like a little kid, I couldn't ignore the uh, adventure, you know. <laughs> so let me set up a little scenery that come to my mind, and I've never seen this before. I've never thought of it like this before. When we think of the upper room, of course, we either think of the classical or traditional room in Old City Jerusalem that they call the upper room. But the truth of the matter is, uh, well, I shouldn't say the truth. There is an option or uh, latitude for the word that we get upper room from to not mean a building room, but the porch of, uh, that's in front of the uh, temple. And that was where the Gentiles could come. They could come to the porch, but they couldn't come in the temple. And as you realize, uh, the heathen, the Gentiles, heard their language, heard the gospel in their own language. And so they couldn't have been in the temple, and those Gentiles probably weren't in a physical building in an upper room. But like I said, there's latitude in that original Greek word to uh, apply to the porch of the temple. Okay, now that being said, let me kind of see if I can pull together a few ideas. In the Old Testament, uh, the Holy Spirit came up on people. Okay, they came up, the Holy Spirit came up on people and empowered them. We call it the kabod or the kabod of God, the weightiness of God. Uh, that's what David felt when he was going to war. Okay, uh, In the New Testament, Jesus began to change things. He was in front of his disciples at one point, and it says, and he breathed on his disciples, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And that was before the day of Pentecost. Now, wait a minute. Now, we don't know that they spoke in tongues at that moment, but they were filled with with the Spirit. That's what it says. Just by the Ruach of God. It came out of Jesus, whatever, however he breathed on. I don't know if he went and breathed and blew on each one of them personally or just by his words, but that's what the word says. Okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> the day of Pentecost was an amazingly pivotal time in history. One we measure to today. We, we call the day of Pentecost uh, when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was upon human humanity. Uh, but now I want to take us, if I can, if I haven't belabored the point too much, I'm fumbling here a little bit, sorry. But I'd like to take us now into a heavenly scene or a heavenly room that is like Hebrews 12. So Hebrews 12 says, For we have come to Mount Zion, is that where the upper room was and is? It was in Mount Zion, Jerusalem. And so we have come to Mount Zion, the city of God, the new Jerusalem, where there are innumerable angels in joyful assembly. I think that day they were pretty happy. Something was up. I can imagine... There, Oh, I'm starting to feel it here. So now I'm in these heavenly places. I have come there, so this is no stretch. There's no grunting required because you're already there. Okay, so I'm in the heavenly places, and Jesus said to the angels, now back a, a few weeks or a year earlier, he said, now angels, did you notice when I breathed on the disciples how the Holy Spirit didn't come up on the, Holy, up on the disciples when I breathed? The Holy Spirit filled the disciples. Did you catch that, angels? Did you catch that? Did you see what I did? Now, angels, we're going to do it, and you're going to be the facilitators. Woohoo! I'm starting to feel that. For angels, you're going to be the facilitators to make a momentous occasion, a date in history that no one will ever forget. And so, angels, I want you to take that, that core essence of causing Holy Spirit to go into my disciples. i got 120 of them here today. Jesus is talking to the angels. 
There's 120 of them. So are you ready? When I count to three, we're going to... <laughs> okay, just go with me. I'm having fun. When I count to three, we're going to flick a switch, and you're the facilitators. Uh, uh, Angel Gabriel, do you have Thaddeus? Okay, you got him. Uh, go over there. Rest on his head. Rest over, over top of him because this is going to be a momentous occasion. And uh, I realize you're going to have to hover there so while, so your wings are going to flap a little bit and make some noise. I know, I know, this is very childlike. But just kind of go with me as I paint the picture a little bit. And so Jesus says on three, you angels, look at me. Everybody ready? One, two, three. And the angels, along with Jesus, begin to breathe the ruach the wind, the breath of God down into the souls, the very core being essence of every disciple, every one of the 120, and he unlocks their spirit. Their soul now is completely like overtaken with the wonder and the empowerment and the overflow from their spirit, and it gushes out of their mouth, glossolalia all over the place. It's a mess. There's glossolalia all over. And everybody hears the gospel in their own language. The room is filled or the porch is filled. The porch of the temple is filled with these saints now that have been changed, radically impacted. Angels all over, there's joy in the camp. Something has happened that is going to be measured for the rest of time on this, upon this day. So anyway, now I just want to enter into it. I just want to say, Jesus, there you were. You set the precedent a few weeks to a year before that by breathing something about this wind of God. And you trained the angels and then you implemented their help. You, you commissioned them to facilitate. And here they not only are then and that day, but they're continuing to do it in our day. I just, I just thank you, Lord, for that picture. Just helps me to not just think of a earthly room, but of a heavenly scene. And it was probably more than just angels. There probably, as he, Hebrews twelve says, the spirits of just men made perfect were there also. They were remembering scriptures out of Psalms and says, "And my people will speak with stammering lips and." The spirits of just men made perfect remembered the word from Psalms. It says, oh, this is that which was spoken of by David. It's happening. Oh, I just see the clamor and the, and the rejoicing and the raucous, joyful heavenlies. As the disciples, all 120, and then soon to be 3,000, came into the kingdom. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I've just blessed that event. i blessed that experience. And now I'm just going to stop here. And if anybody wants to tag team on that, just go wherever you'd like. Day of Pentecost came 2,000 years ago, about. And um, it, it established a new era. And we didn't only get a new era of Holy Spirit, but Randy Clark says we didn't only get the outpouring of Holy Spirit, but we also got an outpouring of angels. Now, that's a quote from Randy Clark. And I think, uh, you know, he probably is predicating that a little bit upon the fact that we had angel angelic activity for each person during that uh, day of Pentecost. Okay, but here's something. Holy Spirit and baptism, Holy Spirit, nearly got stifled off of the face of the earth for much of the last 2,000 years, certainly during the Dark Ages. There was just a candle flicker of the light of, of heaven, the light of the gospel, until... Somewhere in the late 1800s, last decade or so, and then the first decade of 1900, and uh, we begin hearing of the revivals over in, uh, in Europe, 
and then of course here in uh, Wichita, Topeka, and then in uh, Azusa. Something happened. A mo a another something was happening. It's kind of like these rays here behind me. A dawning was happening. A new dawn was happening. A new day was beginning to emerge. And whereas at the beginning of the 1900s, I don't know, I suppose you could have counted those who were filled with the Holy Spirit probably in the hundreds, maybe, maybe. But how many are there now? I think they say there's, is there like, is it 15 million or 150 million around the world? I, th I think they've tried to measure it. It's either 15 million or 150 million. I just heard it just uh, last week or two. 150 million people who have experienced baptism, Holy Spirit, when it was almost cut off from the earth for most of the last 2,000 years. Well, not only that, but I believe you and I, our faith is that we're also seeing the re-emergence, insurgents of angelic. And why would we need angels? It seems as though... It seems as though that in Bible, in the scripture, there is a precedent that whenever there is a major happening, a God happening, a transition in mankind's history, it's usually predicated or prefaced or uh, announced or helped by angelic. Okay? Well, you and I believe we're moving into a new era, a new age, and we've just seen 120 years, something like that, of baptism of the Holy Spirit beginning to promulgate on the earth. We see it. It's got a big footprint now. I think with all my heart, the angelic is coming right up front and center. It's going to be core to what we think and how we talk, our narrative about the gospel, about our activity in the kingdom. It's going to be just very central. So uh, uh, kind of building that a little bit on Randy Clark's deal that with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we didn't only get an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but we also got an outpouring of angels. Well, we're at another pivotal line in history, and uh, I think we expect a lot of angelic help.